All right, glad you guys are here today for our conference. I'm just going to go over a few uh, few um, uh, rules here, uh, j just, some, just some standard things. But uh, due to our parking situation, we don't need anyone to park against the blue doors over there. It's an active business going on. Uh, as far as the itinerary goes, we did make a change last night, uh, moving session four to session three. Just there's, there's a title change there if you got the, the card on the way in. And we have opened up a Q&A, which was on high demand. Uh, for Dr. Bill. So our fourth session today will be a Q&A. &A. And uh, that is only as good as you make it. So if you have questions along through the day, uh, grab a card, write it down, drop it in the Q&A box that is at the door when you came in. Uh, Dr. Bill has written over 20 books and commentaries, and they are there are some massive, massive books that he has written. Uh, if you added up all the, that would be interesting to add the page count up of all the books that he has written, because the two of them that I have, three of them, are, they're, they're just massive. And uh, <laughs> that's just massive, impressive, uh, lots of lots of words. But we do have uh, four or five of his titles available that coincide with this conference that are at the front as you walked in today. And they are first come, first serve. What you see is all there is. The prices are out there. You can write a check to the Church at Pecan Creek. You can give by cash in the box or you can give by uh, PayPal, giving at the Church at Pecan Creek. If you have any questions about any of that, uh, feel free to see me. Uh, lunch, you will be on your own. We'll close the building down. And there are tons of restaurants within just a few miles from here. If you need a, a recommendation, just feel free to see me as well. I can point you in the right direction. Uh, each session, strive to be back here and seated on time. Uh, as you know, he has, he has great information that we're all, all chomping at the bit to hear today, so we don't want to delay those sessions. Uh, lunch break, make sure you do pick somewhere that you can eat relatively fast and get back here and be seated and be ready to go by 1.30. Uh, coffee is on tap in the back there, so you guys feel free to get coffee at any moment. Restrooms, obviously, right there. Our square footage is expansive here. Don't get lost. If you do, just yell and someone will come find you. All right. Uh, without any further ado, let me introduce Dr. Bill. Uh, he's written over 20 books and commentaries. He's one of the leading scholars on the book of Revelation and biblical interpretation. His Revelation commentary has proven to be one of the most prolific commentaries ever written. Dr. Gregory K. Bill is professor of New Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary in Dallas. He has had a long and distinguished academic career teaching at Grove City College, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, Wheaton Graduate School, and Westminster Theological Seminary. Before joining the RTS Dallas faculty in 2021, he served as Westminster's J. Gresham Machem Chair and Research Professor of New Testament and Biblical Interpretation. He is a past president of the Evangelical Theological Society. Dr. Bill's a native Texan, woohoo, and a graduate of Southern Methodist University, uh, SMU, Dallas Theological Seminary, and Cambridge University. And by the way, we are streaming today, and if you're at home watching, uh, we will be following our schedule. Just a quick reference, 8.45 to 10.30. The second session will be 10.45 to 12.15. Third session will be at 1.30 to 2.45. Hope you're writing quickly if you're listening. And fourth session will be 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And let's open in prayer, and then we'll welcome our speaker today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for working through uh, Dr. Gregory Bill's life and uh, providentially providing for him all of these years and equipping his mind and, and the study of your word and his desire to know you, to know your word, and to spend all the countless hours that he has doing so. Uh, we thank you for the research that he has put in and the books that he has written, and we pray that he would equip us today, Lord, with his knowledge and his research. May we learn and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's welcome Dr. Gregory Bill. So Trey, I know we're starting late. What what time uh, do I need to finish this session? Is it, is it ten thirty? What? Oh, okay. Let's see, ten thirty. Okay, okay. All right. Okay. All right. We're, start, we're starting 15 minutes late. That's an important 15 minutes. So. Okay, if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn to chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. <clears throat> and uh, just as a beginning, we're just going to read verses 1 to 3. Verses 1 to 3. Chapter 1. 
The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his bondservants the things which must shortly take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. So uh, I'm reading, you're hearing, and may the Lord give us grace to keep the things who are parents as uh, our children are, are growing up from uh, being toddlers on up to teenagers. We have to find various creative ways to, to discipline them and to get their attention that the particular behavioral track they're on is not the one that they should be on. And sometimes they rebel against that. And, and we have to figure out creative ways to uh, discipline them to get their attention. Many of us have heard in the news, perhaps, how teenagers or young people have come under the influence of a cult. And then parents will hire some detective, and the detective will go uh, get this person out of the cult. And they have to be deprogrammed. Uh, they have to use radical methods to, to deprogram them uh, from uh, the falsehoods of the cult that they become very enamored with. <clears throat> Over the last few years, we hear about earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, especially in the United States, devastating tornadoes. And we see the, uh, we hear about them, but it becomes a lot different when you see this devastation. Um, often when people see it on television um, or in various forms of media, uh, they're moved to, uh, to give some money to help support what's been going on. But if you just hear about it, sometimes you're not moved. But seeing it, that's a lot different. And um, the point is that we are people who need something radical to get our attention in order to change, whether it's a bad habit whatever it may be, in order to respond to a bad situation. So if this is true on the mundane, everyday, physical level, it's true, especially on the spiritual level, that we, as God's people, can become conformed to the world. We become anesthetized and, and don't even realize that we are on a bad track. And so what we want to do is ask what radical actions God takes to get our attention when we are anesthetized spiritually. The book of Revelation is a good place to see what radical way God does get our attention. How does God communicate to his people in this book? <clears throat> now, one popular approach that I was taught uh, in seminary, um, and it's true in many, many churches, is the book of Revelation is to be taken very literally. Uh, in fact, the the approach is this, interpret everything as literally as you can unless you're forced to interpret symbolically. And so <clears throat> this view understands most of Revelation's pictures as a depiction of literal physical realities to happen in the future, especially chapters 4 on to chapters 22 and verse 5. So in chapter 17 where there's this judgment, it's a 100-pound hail, uh, not baseball hail, 100-pound hail. That's very literal, and so on. So in chapter uh, 9, when you see uh, uh, huge, uh, apocalyptic, flying scorpions uh, that, that uh, basically uh, have stingers as tails, and, and they kill people, uh, some think those are... Um, um, helicopters with guns in their tails and that sort of thing. It, it take, they take it very literally. Um, so I would say the main approach is take things literally, unless you're forced to take them symbolically. Well, what we want to do, we want to look at that. <clears throat> we want to see, does Revelation say anything about how we should approach the book? Well, I think it does. And um, <clears throat> chapter 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his bondservants 
the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John. Now that word there, you see that word communicated right there? Very crucial word. Um, and it's intriguing when you look at different English translations, um, that word that we were just looking at, communicated in Greek, don't worry about the Greek, but it's pronounced a semenon, and um, uh, it's translated communicated in the New American Standard, as we just saw. In the Revised Standard Version, in the NIV, the Jerusalem Bible, the English Standard Version, etc., it's translated made known. And in the King James and the Douay Catholic Version, uh, the Authorized Standard Version, uh, it's translated signified. And um, some translations have made clear. So, you know, when you see uh, English translations that are uh, translating a word differently, there's a problem. Uh, the, the translation committee, every, tra every Bible has a translation committee of, of biblical scholars, and they're translating this word differently. So you've got to dig in. <clears throat> What's going on here? Well, um, this word uh, here uh, occurs elsewhere in the New Testament, uh, uh, and it occurs in the Greek world outside the New Testament. Uh, and it, it can sometimes uh, mean symbolize or signify, communicate by symbols. That's not an untypical meaning. It can also have these other meanings, made known, signified, made clear. So it can, the word can have those meanings. What does it mean here, though? And <clears throat> by the way, this, uh, the noun form of this word here, uh, se semino, is semea, which means sign, which is the word used for Jesus' miracles. Why are they not just called miracles instead of signs? Well, the reason is that what he does uh, signifies something that he does spiritually as well. For example, in Mark chapter 2, you remember he heals a lame man, and that was symbolic of his ability to heal spiritually, to forgive sins. In fact, he says that, that, that healing there, he actually says it means I can forgive sins. And then when he uh, feeds the multitudes in John 6, that, that, that was symbolic of his ability to give and nourish spiritual life. So this word often has this notion of being a symbol. Now, in our passage, <clears throat> let's look at this, and uh, you'll notice if you have margins in your Bible, how many people have Bible with margins? Um, okay, that's very important to have a Bible with margins because many Bibles, my New American Standard Bible has um, in the margin Daniel 2, 28 and 29. And so when you look at this uh, passage, here are the key words. The word revelation, God, show what must take place, and that word, say, mino, that's the questionable word here. It's translated, communicate, etc. Now, <clears throat> this group of four words occurs uniquely only in Daniel 2, 28 and 29. There is a God in heaven who reveals, that's the word here for uh, revelation, he reveals mysteries, he has shown what must take place, what must take place, show. And then that's repeated in verse 45, God has signified what must take place. So this grouping of words here occurs only in Daniel 2, 28 and 29. Now if my wife were here, she'd say, okay, big deal. So what difference does that make? Because I get all excited when I find stuff in the Old Testament that is you know, used in the New Testament, and I get so excited, I, I, I forget to say, so what difference does that make? So I have a wife who is a very good biblical interpreter that God has given me so that I'm not always up in the clouds. Um, as my mother used to say sometimes uh, about certain people are so heavenly-minded that they're no earthly good. 
And you've heard that. You've probably heard that. Um, <clears throat> so, so what difference does it make? Well, you've got to go to the context of Daniel 2. Now, the Old Testament and the New Testament is such a huge area. Uh, and uh, I would encourage you if, you, if you've not done much work in that, to really look at the quotations. Start with the quotations. Uh, there, one of the books out there is called Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. That would be a good one to get. Um, because you can't understand the New Testament without the Old. And here's a good example of it. You have to look at the context. What's Daniel 2 about? Daniel 2 is about Nebuchadnezzar who had a dream. And it was a dream. He could remember the dream. He didn't know the meaning, though. So he asked Daniel. Um, and he asked his soothsayers, they couldn't uh, interpret the dream. But the dream was about a, a giant statue he saw in four sections. One was the head of gold. And uh, he had a head of gold, and then uh, the three other sections were different sections. And they represented four kingdoms. The head of gold was Babylon. The next section was the Medo Persian kingdom. The third was the Greek kingdom. And the last. Uh, is not really uh, clearly discerned, but it's probably Rome and, and kingdoms that continue on from Rome. And so this image in the vision, he has uh, a, a stone is cut out with hands from heaven, and it strikes the image and just shatters it in such tiny pieces that the winds carry it away. And then it says, and God's kingdom replaced it, and that kingdom would be a kingdom forever. So, so what's going on here? Do we take the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had and that Daniel interpreted, do we take that literally? In other words, or is that image kind of like a, a robotic Godzilla that's going to walk through the cities of the world? Is that the way we're to take that vision? Um, I don't think so. It, that, that vision is like when the newspapers... Uh, Picture a Democrat as a donkey and a Republican as an elephant or Russia as a bear. We don't take those literally. And so I think what our passage is saying here, since this is from Daniel, then, uh, and Daniel is purely symbolic. It's about a symbolic communication that Daniel interprets. That's what this is about. Let's, let's, let's look, look at the uh, verse again. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place, and he sent, and he communicated by symbols. He signified it by his angel to his bondservant, John. This is the, in fact, the book of Revelation gets its name from the first word here, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the programmatic verse of the whole book. And it's not only giving us the title of the book, it's telling us how the book is to be interpreted. So that instead of that approach, which I just mentioned, that I learned in school, and many churches do take, and, uh, and what is it? Interpret the book literally, unless you're forced to interpret figuratively. No, I think we should take it this way. Interpret the book figuratively, unless you're forced to interpret literally. Uh, better said, perhaps, we should expect symbols in this book. I remember when I was teaching on the book of Revelation, a student came up to me and said, in my church, you're a liberal if you take the book of Revelation figuratively, because in, in some passages there are resurrections, and if you take those figuratively, then... One might say, well, should we take Christ's resurrection figuratively and symbolically so it's not literal? Of course not. I wouldn't take that view. But I told him, because I take verse 1 literally, that it's literally telling me this book is going to be about symbols, that I take the book symbolically. So, um, uh, uh, if you will, what, what is literal interpretation? Literal interpretation is getting at what the intended uh, meaning of the author was, whatever that is. If it's symbolism, fine. If it's a, a literalism, fine. So um, what we do then, the, the dictum of the popular approach to Revelation needs to be turned on its head. Expect symbols. 
Now, if the main mode of communication is re of revelation is that of symbolism, how should we interpret the symbols? And I, I just want to stop here for a moment because um, I've seen that the key to interpreting verse 1 is from the Old Testament. And um, that's really crucial. And I, and I think maybe it would be really important. Uh, I usually don't do this, but... Any questions about this? Because this is crucial before we go on. Any questions about what we've done here? Any questions about uh, how Daniel is determining and showing that uh, Revelation is a book of symbolism? Any, any, any questions here? Because this is a good example of how crucial the Old Testament is. So I'll be happy to have, have a brief conversation with anybody. Uh, if you have a question, feel free. Okay. Um, so now, if the main mode of communication to Revelation is that of symbolism, how should we interpret the symbols? How do you interpret them? Well, some are interpreted by the book itself. Uh, that's very nice. For example, John sees Jesus having seven stars in his hand. The seven stars are defined in chapter 1 and verse 20 as... Uh, Seven angels, and he's walking in the midst of seven lampstands. The lampstands are said explicitly in verse 20 of chapter 1 to be the seven churches. And then in, in chapter 4 and verse 5, before the throne are seven lamps of fire. And right there it says, these are the seven spirits of God. And why seven? Well, there aren't seven literal spirits. Seven is the number of fullness. And so this is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The bowls of incense, chapter 5 and verse 8 says, are the prayers of the saints. The great dragon in chapter 12 and verse 9 is said to be Satan. The saints fine linen, bright and clean, is said to be the righteous acts of the saints. Now, whenever these symbols appear early in the book and then they appear later but they're not explained, we should uh, take them uh, with their earlier meaning. So that's helpful. Um, unfortunately, most of the symbols in the book are not explained, like the ones I, I just told you. If they were, the commentaries on the book of Revelation would be very, very thin, very thin. It would really, really be nice. Um, I, maybe it would have taken me uh, a month to write a commentary on the book of Revelation instead of eight years. So... Um, uh, but most of the symbols that are not interpreted are Old Testament allusions. And so you can go back to the Old Testament. What do they mean there? And then you come back, and that gives you a very good uh, uh, help in trying to determine what it means. It doesn't solve it all, but it, it really helps. It's like the book of Revelation of those symbols in chapters 4 to 22 it's like an apocalyptic sea. I mean, you're almost drowned. These symbols are so hard. Uh, and, however, if you notice that they come from an Old Testament passage, then that's like getting a, standing on a sandbar, and getting your head above the waves, and you can begin to see uh, everything a little bit better. So uh, that's absolutely crucial. As I said, the numbers are symbolic. Uh, seven, the number of completeness comes probably from the seven days of creation, uh, seven days of the week, even the, uh, the seals, the trumpets and the bowl judgments in the book of Revelation, they're all seven, show completeness, especially completeness in judgment. Um, so, the main way that Revelation communicates is by symbolism. So we should interpret Revelation primarily in a symbolic fashion, not literally. Now, now we need to ask, why? Why is the book of Revelation mainly symbolic? Why did God communicate it that way by an angel to John? Neither Paul nor the other New Testament writers use this as a main way of communication. Yes, Jesus did speak in parables. Uh, but the book of Revelation is just symbol after symbol after symbol after symbol. So it's pretty unique in the New Testament. 
Why does John do this in the book of Revelation? Well, there's no doubt. We can think about a few reasons. Number, number one, the visions could not be expressed by words alone, since John saw a lot of strange things that are hard to put into words. Secondly, the symbols show continuity with the Old Testament, since many of them come from the Old Testament. So it shows, hey, uh, this, book, uh, this book of Revelation is really in some way organically related to the Old Testament. And thirdly, uh, the symbols make the diligent reader of God's word dig deeper in order to get the richer treasures. If you don't work in understanding the book, you're going to have difficulty grasping its message. Uh, as Proverbs 2 says in verse 2, Make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you'll discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Now, that's especially true of the book of Revelation. You have to dig. You have to work. And, um, and it, it's, uh, it's hard. But I don't think the, the, the reasons I just gave, I don't think those are the main reasons that um, the book is communicated by symbolism. Um, it's not because he couldn't describe th things, he just keeps the symbols that he sees. Uh, I don't think it's just to show continuity with the Old Testament. I don't think it's just to make people dig deeper. I think the main way to understand why there's so much uh, symbolism is that John was a prophet like Jesus and the Old Testament prophets. And to understand the way John communicates as a prophet, we must understand how did the Old Testament uh, prophets use symbolism? How did Jesus use symbolism? And if we can find that out, then we're on a, a, a good road to understanding why John uses revelation, uh, symbolism so much in Revelation. So <clears throat> we can begin by saying this. The Old Testament prophets and Jesus predominantly use symbolism in response to one situation. I repeat that. The Old Testament prophets and Jesus predominantly used symbolism in response to one situation. What was that? Well, if we think about the Old Testament prophets here for a moment, the prophets living toward the end of Israel's history had the primary role of warning Israel to repent or they would be judged. Remember Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, hey, if you don't repent, you're going into exile. The northern tribes ended up going into the Assyrian exile. And the southern tribes went into Babylonian exile. But the, those prophets were warning them uh, to repent. And so they wouldn't go into exile. Well, well they didn't. But by the time their minister, of their ministries, their message was judgment is coming. Because they could see there was no repentance. Judgment is coming. But you could be delivered from it in some way. Um, they deliver their warnings in a very rational and sermonic manner, convicting their audience of sin and self-serving moral permissiveness, recalling to them lessons from their own history, but they had little positive effect in straightforward, historical, sermonic kinds of warnings. And so, what had happened, their hearts had become hardened to rational propositional, historic, and sermonic warning methods. So what did the prophets do to get the attention at least of the faithful remnant? They took up forms of warning which might gain them a better hearing or better attention. They used symbolic actions and parables, symbolic words. But such a change in warning form was effective only with the faithful remnant with those who have ears to hear and hear not, and have become hard-hearted, symbolic language and parables cause them to misunderstand further. So what we're going to see is when the prophets use symbolism, the majority of Israel ha had become hardened. And the remnant, the faithful remnant, were becoming anesthetized. They were becoming part of that hardened lump. And so when the prophets use this symbolism, what it does is, it's a form of judgment for the unbelievers who had become intractable in their repentance. They, they, they had been warnings again and again and again, repent, repent, repent. Finally, 
they're hardened. And when the symbols come, the symbols are a form of judgment for them. It causes them to misunderstand further. However, with the faithful remnant, it shocks them out of their anesthesia and causes them to come back into the reality of their faithful relation to God. Let's look at, let's look at a few examples of that. Um, when we look at Isaiah, Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, 8, 13, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Verse 9, he said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Make the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. So basically, uh, Isaiah, first of all, is commanded to tell the people, uh, listen, listen but don't perceive. Look, but don't understand. Can you imagine if you're going to teach a Sunday school or Bible study or uh, your pastor gets up and he says, keep listening, but don't perceive this morning. Keep looking, but don't understand. And then God tells you, your message this morning is to make the hearts of the congregation insensitive. Make their ears dull, their eyes dim. Wow, that, that's a command from God. That's, that's hard to believe. I, I think if I or maybe Trey got that message, we'd think, that, that's, a, that's from a demon. I'm going to look in another passage. And uh, no, Isaiah knew this was from God. This is one of the hardest verses in all of the Old Testament because it's theologically difficult, isn't it? Well, the reason for it is that Israel had been given many, many warnings again and again and again. And finally, God says, you're intractable, the majority, you're intractable, so I'm going to make you even more insensitive than you have been. In fact, you love those idols? They, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. I'm going to make you like those idols, spiritually. You're going to be as spiritually inanimate as those idols, and that's the judgment here. That's the judgment. So they've come to a point of hardening, of intractability, the majority of the nation of Israel. And so that's when symbols come to actually cause them to misunderstand further. It sounds very harsh, but it's a judgment. You have to realize that. This is a judgment. They're becoming, they're, be, they're being made like that. You love idols? Then you're going to become like it. It's just like when uh, at the end time, those who have not wanted to be with God in his presence and with his people at the end of time, God will say, what you've loved in this life, you will get in the next life. You'll be separated from me and my people in the next life. So people get what they love often, and that becomes a judgment. Well, where are the symbols here? Because the people clearly here are said to be hardened. Well, in Isaiah, in the next chapter, Isaiah's son, in chapter 7, verse 3, uh, the Lord says to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shirar Yashub. Go to the end of the conduit of the upper pool, etc. But his son's name is Shirar Yashub. Now, I have a little footnote in my Bible. And you probably do, too. And his son's name, which sounds really weird. You know, we often give our children... Uh, biblical names. I've never heard of a son called Shirar Yashub. Um, it means a remnant shall return. A remnant shall return. And so, why? Why would you give your child that kind of name? You know, some people probably thought Isaiah. You know, Isaiah, he's just so biblical. He's, he's, it's just, he's, he's gotten too consumed with the Bible and, and, and he's named his son this. But when it's late in the evening and a little remnant will return, is late for dinner, and Isaiah's wife said, remnant will return, please come home, Cherry Yashub. And again, most of Israel say, what a stupid name. You know, Isaiah and his wife, 
Gosh, typical prophet. And, but he was a walking parable. Most didn't understand it. They thought it was stupid. But those who were faithful got shocked back into the reality of their faith. Isaiah's not stupid. Isaiah's a prophet sent by God. That son is a walking message. It means that if we don't repent, then we'll go into captivity. But if we're faithful, we'll come back. That's the note of deliverance. God will deliver us spiritually, even though physically we'll go into captivity, but we'll, we'll return. But it's a statement about going into captivity. And then in chapter 8, the Lord says to Isaiah, 8 verse 1, Take for yourself a large tablet, write on it in ordinary letters, swift as the booty, speedy as the prey. And I'll take to myself faithful witnesses for a testimony about that. Swift as the booty, speedy as the prey. What, is, what does that mean? Well, it means that they're going to be invaded by a foreign power and they'll get all their goods and their possessions. Uh, they'll be a speedy prey. And then in verse 3, it says, Isaiah says, I approached the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord said to me, name him Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. Now, can you imagine naming your kid uh, Mahar Shalal Hashbaz? I haven't heard any children named that. I've heard Daniel and Nathan and Noah, but not Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. It means swift as the booty, speedy as the prey. So when little swift as the beauties, booties, speedy as the prey is late for dinner. Uh, Isaiah's wife says, uh, uh, Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, come home. And of course, again, most of the neighbors, oh, what stupid, that's even worse than uh, a remnant will return. But those who had faith, those who were coming, they were beginning to be shocked by this message. They, Isaiah's not stupid, named this kid for a reason. It's a parable of what's going to happen to us. And, and they, they would be shocked, shocked back into the reality of their faith. So n notice that this is what happens uh, after Israel has reached an intractable point. They have been hardened. They're anesthetized. So symbols come to actually cause them to misunderstand further, but the remnant faithful is shocked back into the reality of their faith. Um, so... We, we also have in Isaiah uh, chapter 20, Isaiah acts out a parable for over a three-year period by walking naked and barefoot before the eyes of Israelite onlookers. It's a symbol. In chapter 20, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. Um, it says, in the year that the commander came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Syria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and captured it, at that time the Lord spoke through Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loosen the sackcloth from your hips. Take off your shoes from your feet. And Isaiah did so, going naked and barefoot. Now, this was in Egypt. And Israel had gone to Egypt to find safety in disobedience to God. And so, he went uh, naked and barefoot. The Lord said, even as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot three years as a sign, as a parable, as a symbol, as a symbol and token against Egypt and Ethiopia, so the king of Assyria will lead away the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Ethiopia, young and old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And the Jews who had sought refuge there would go in exile with them. Then they'll be dismayed and ashamed because of Ethiopia, their hope, and Egypt, their boast. This was our hope. And so Isaiah walks naked. And by the way, what's the definition of naked? Well, we know at least the definition is his buttocks were showing. And so it's a sign of what would happen to people going into exile. Now, again, um, while we may not name our kids, remnant will return, or swift as the booty, speedy as the prey, 
uh, I don't recommend that uh, our church leaders go naked for three years. This is, a, th this is a sign and symbol that was a unique, redemptive, historical thing in Israel. Now, um, in Ezekiel chapter 12, you might remember this. In Ezekiel chapter 12, Isaiah uh, digs through the wall, part of the wall in Jerusalem. And I'm not going to read it all, but he digs through a wall, and he, he, he takes his possessions and puts it on his back and crawls through this hole. Again, majority of Israel, what a stupid prophet. Those who had eyes to see and ears to hear thought, you know what, he's a sign. This is what's going to happen to us. We're going to, the wall's going to be broken down. We'll take what possessions we can, and we're going to go into exile. And it's very important that when Ezekiel performs that symbolic act, it is after chapter 12 and verse 2. Listen to it. Son of man, Ezekiel, you live in the midst of the rebellious people who have eyes to see but do not see, ears to hear but do not hear, for they are a rebellious house. So as in Isaiah 6, they become hardened. What happens after they're hardened? The symbols come to judge the majority. But the shock, the remnant faithful back into the reality of their faith. And that's what's going on there. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 3, I just I want to show you this pattern because it's just amazing because we're going to see it in the New Testament. In chapter 3 of Ezekiel, in verse 27, it says, Thus says the Lord, he who hears, let him hear. And he refuses to hear, let him refuse. For they are a rebellious house. Same thing. What happens when it's clear that they're a rebellious house, they refuse to hear, they're hardened? What happens? Chapter 4. Listen to what chapter 4 says. Now you, son of man, Ezekiel, get yourself a brick. Place it before you, inscribe a city on it in Jerusalem. Then lay siege against it, build a siege wall, raise up a ramp, pitch camps, and place battering rams against it all around. In other words, he's supposed to get a little brick, kind of like kids in a sand pile making a little fort. He's, he's, he's to make... Uh, the brick is the city, and he is to uh, put some little bitty siege works against it that the enemy will, will put against the wall of Jerusalem. And, and he even says, set up an iron plate uh, as an iron wall between you and the city. Set your face toward it so that it is under siege, and you besiege the city. This is a symbol to the house of Israel. So it's just a little model thing he makes of a city and how the enemy is going to uh, try to get over the walls. Um, and then he says, this is really weird. This is as weird as Isaiah going naked. As for you, Ezekiel, lie down on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel on it. You shall bear their iniquity for the number of days that you lie on it. For I have assigned you a number of days corresponding to the years of their iniquity. 390 days you will bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. Can you imagine laying down on your left side? and symbolically uh, bearing people's sins. I don't know how symbolically he did it, but he's laying on his left side. Now, I, I don't think he did that 24 hours a day. I kind of think that was his job, probably from 9 uh, to 12, you know, and maybe he had lunch. and then. Uh, but that was his job for that, uh, that, that, that period of time. And, and then he's to do the same thing. Uh, again, he says... Um, when you have completed these, you'll lie down a second time on your right side. Bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. I've assigned it to you for 40 days. So uh, this is all very weird, but these are all parables, symbols to shock people. Ezekiel, why are you doing this? And I'm sure he explained it. And so the majority just, as the majority today would think he was just stupid and crazy. But this was a parable, a symbol to shock the faithful remnant back into the reality of their faith and to actually judge the majority who were already intractably hardened. So the symbols come not to enlighten everybody, but to judge the majority, enlighten the remnant faithful. So parables, the par parables of the prophets have a shock effect for genuine believers who become anesthetized because of living among other unspiritual people. They're intended to have a jolting effect on the remnant who become complacent among the compromising majority. 
The majority did not want to hear the truth. And when it was presented straightforwardly to convict them of sin, they would not accept the fact of their sin. The parables, however, function to awake those among the true righteous from their sinful sleep. And so we've seen this pattern. Israel is now in a hardened, anesthetized state. Now they're going to get symbols to judge, but to shock the faithful remnant back into the reality of their faith. So when we come to the New Testament, that's the role of symbols with the prophets. How about with Jesus, the prophet par excellence? Well, let's see. Let's go to uh, Matthew, and let's read it. He who has ears, let him hear. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that's language that's very familiar because it implies also that many don't have ears, and we're going to see that. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? This is a marvelous question. Why do you speak to them in symbolic parables? And he says, he answered and said to them, To you has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, the majority, it has not been granted. He's speaking to the disciples who, re who represent the remnant of true Israel. That's why they're 12, not 15, not 6. They're 12 because what he's doing is he is reconstituting true Israel around himself. And so they're the ones who are going to be shocked into the reality of their faith because they have a hard time believing as you read the gospel, read Mark. They have a hard time believing, as we're going to see. Um, For whoever has, to him shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance. But whoever does not have, whatever he has shall be taken away from him. So you, 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 you see that this, sound, this sounds harsh, doesn't it? What's happened? We're going to see. The majority of Israel at Jesus' time had become intractably hardened and anesthetized. And so, um, this is a very severe judgment upon them. In other words, symbols. What are symbols? It's like raising a flag. Okay, judgment's here. But for the remnant, hopefully they'll be shocked into the reality of their faith. Therefore, I speak to them in parables. Why? Because now he's going to quote Isaiah 6. Because while seeing, they don't see. While hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. He's quoting Isaiah 6. The same thing that happened in Isaiah's day is happening in Jesus' day. In fact, what happened in Isaiah's day was a foreshadowing of what happened in Jesus' day. And in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled which he actually now quotes very formally, you'll keep on hearing, but will not understand. You see how he says the prophecy is being fulfilled? It didn't look like uh, Isaiah was prophesying back there in Isaiah 6. It just talks about how Israel was hardened. That was a foreshadowing, what we call a typological foreshadowing. Uh, Isaiah, and, and what happened in his day, was a foreshadowing. It was pointing forward, even at that time of what would happen in Jesus' day, and now it's happening, and so therefore he says it's fulfilled. And he quotes it, you keep on hearing, but will not understand. You'll not, you will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, their ears they scarcely hear, they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I should heal them. That's a very long quotation. And by the way, it's quoted in Luke, in Mark, in John 12, and at the end of the book of Acts. It's a very important uh, quotation, and the point was that Israel had become so intractably unbelieving that Jesus was reconstituting a new Israel around himself. He was the true Israel. He was doing what Israel should have done. If you want to be true Israel, you better gather around him. Now, the shock. Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. He's convinced the disciples are slowly but surely coming out of the anesthetized lump. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, to hear what you hear, did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. And then he starts giving parables, uh, spoken parables, just like the prophets would do. 
Uh, he sometimes acted out parables. Um, when he, for example, cleansed the temple. But, and, and by the way, whenever he did a miracle, that was an acted out parable. But here we have parables. He gives the parable of the sower. He gives the parable of um, the, the, the various, uh, uh, the wheat and the tares, how uh, weeds will grow up among God's faithful. Uh, the parable of uh, the leaven, how the kingdom grows invisibly, uh, how small it begins as a mustard seed, so forth. He gives these parables. And uh, he ends it. Toward the end, he says, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun and the kingdom of the Father. And as a bookend, just as it began, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. So the purpose of his parables was to spiritually blind further and deafen further the majority of the hearers. But blessed are you, he says, to reveal truth to the small faithful circle within the nation. That was the second purpose. It's just as the case with the prophets. And Jesus is the prophet par excellence. So he sometimes delivered his warnings in a very rational, sermonic way convicting his audience of sin and self-serving moral permissiveness, recalling to them the lessons of uh, their history in Israel. But uh, as was the case with the prophets before him, people were intractable. They'd become hardened, and uh, they'd become anesthetized again because of their habitual avoidance to change their comfortable lifestyle. Their hearts had become hardened, to straightforward, propositional, historical, and sermonic warning methods. So like the prophets, Jesus takes up the same kind of symbolic warning. Hardening occurs, then the symbols come to judge, but to shock the faithful remnant into the reality of their faith. Now, I said the disciples were part of this sinful lump. And um, why, why would I say that? Well, Mark 8 applies the language of Isaiah 6, uh, hearing but not hearing, seeing but not hearing, he applies it to the disciples. How can he do that? Because that's language applied to the intractable, hardened majority of Israel. How can he apply Isaiah 6 to the disciples? Well, listen to it. In Mark 8 and verse 15, he says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, in the Matthean parallel to this, uh, it, it's very clear that they thought Jesus was talking about the bad bakeries of the Pharisees, that they just didn't make good bread. That, that, that's how perceptive they were. And, um, and so they begin to discuss one another the fact they had no bread. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you discuss the fact you have no bread? Do you not, and here it is, here's the Isaiah language, do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Do you not yet understand? And he then talks about the five loaves that he gave the 5,000 and the 4,000. He says, do you not yet understand? That, that, that was a parable. Do you not yet understand? But do you notice here, he doesn't apply the language of Isaiah to the disciples as a fact, as describing them. He poses questions. Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? So they're coming out. They're coming out of this hardened lump. The fact that he's asking these questions shows it's not a description of them, but it's really a, a, a way to get them to continue to come out of the hardened lump that they have become part of. They'd come under the influence of the spiritually numbed uh, majority of the nation. And Jesus thinks better of his followers. But it's, it's hard for them. In fact, they, they don't understand it. Even after his resurrection in Acts 1, they said, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he rebukes the question. And uh, I'm not going to get into that one, but um, I'll be happy to if you want a question and answer. But the point is, they don't, they don't understand. So, those who have ears to hear and hear not have become irretrievably hard-hearted, and symbolic language parable and perils cause them to misunderstand further. That's with the prophets of old, Jesus' parables were a sign, a flag that's being raised, that judgment had come upon the majority. 
Israel was being rejected as God's people. He himself was doing what Israel should have done. And if you want to be part of Israel, you had to gather around him as the 12 did. They were symbolic of true Israel being reconstituted. So symbolic parable enlightens a believer through shock, but hardens the unbeliever. It's significant to hear and to remember the pattern. Statement that Israel in the Old Testament was irretrievably hardened, intractable, after many, many times of warnings to repent. And after that, then come the symbols to cause them to misunderstand further as a judgment but to shock the faithful majority, minority into the reality of their faith. So when we come to John and the book of Revelation, he stands at the end of Israel's very existence. As a nation, they rejected Christ and his warnings. But how does this help us understand Revelation's use of symbols? Well, the phrase at the end of each of the seven letters, you remember that phrase? Let's look at it. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then 13.9 says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. But the, at the end of each of the letters, you have that phrase. It, it, it reminds us of something, doesn't it? Yeah. It reminds us of what we saw in the Old Testament. Uh, we saw that Isaiah 6.10, the ears are dull, the eyes dim, they don't see with their eyes, hear with their ears. And then we have uh, Ezekiel, he who hears, let him hear. That's very, almost identical to what Jesus and John is saying. The rebellious house who have eyes to see but do not see, ears to hear but do not hear. And then Jesus, who has an ear, ears let him hear. He's referring back to Ezekiel and to Isaiah, and so is John. This refers back. So what's going on here? Why would we have that statement after each at the end of each of the, of the letters, seven times. Why? It's a kind of summary of Jesus' use of Isaiah 6 to explain that the way Jesus used symbolic language and the way the prophets used it is the way it's being used now in the book of Revelation. Just as Jesus began speaking in some symbolic language on earth, he continues to speak in symbolic language from heaven. And he's sending his angel to continue his parabolic ministry on earth, even though he has now ascended to heaven. As in the Old Testament, Jesus' parables, a hearing formula of the letters, he who has an ear, let him hear. Now notice that phrase seven times in the letters. Now the letters are the introduction to the book. And what this is saying is, yes, there may be a remnant who has ears, but of course, the context of that means the majority don't. The majority are hardened. And what makes that clear is, if you look at the letters, the worst churches are the first Ephesus and uh, the last Laodicea. Those are the worst. They're on the verge of being disowned by Christ. To Ephesus, he says, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Well, a lampstand was the identification as the church, as God's people. He's going to reject them as God's people. To Laodicea says, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. It's even worse. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Then the second letter and the sixth letter, there's no rebuke of the church. No rebuke of Smyrna and of Philadelphia. And then the three middle ones are pretty bad. Three middle churches are pretty bad. And the middle verse of all the letters, I was shocked to find this out, but the middle verse of all the letters is chapter 2 and verse 23. I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I'll give to each one of you according to your deeds. That's the middle verse. So what's the significance of this structure? I think what's going on here is that we're, we're being told what the church was like in the first century, and it's seven for the number of completeness for the church universal throughout all the generations. And the church is not 
in a healthy condition in the first century or today. Some are on the verge of non-existence, being disowned. Others are very unhealthy. Only a remnant are faithful. Only a remnant, two. We're going to see that that's the number of witness, the number of the witnessing remnant in our next message. So you get hardening. He who has an ear, let him hear. Seven times, number of completeness. And after that, what do you get? Massive series of symbols from chapters 4 all the way to 22. <coughs> Same pattern, isn't it? Hardening, and then these symbols. Why? It's got to be the same reason as uh, with Jesus and the prophets, as a form of judgment for those who have become intractable, but as a shock, an instrument of shocking for the remnant. And there is a remnant we know, especially from the two churches that are, that are faithful, and certainly some from some of the uh, middle three, um, at least. So in Jesus and John's day, Israel had become like Pharaoh, who repeatedly received God's warning signs, but rejected them because of his hardened heart. Now, and this, is, this, is shock, this was shocking to me, I have to admit to you, when I came to this conclusion. Now, the church, the continuation of true end-time Israel, had become already spiritually like Israel of old and were in the same danger. In fact, both in the Gospel of John and Revelation, the plague signs of the Exodus are repeatedly alluded to. The, the, the series of the trumpets and bowls are modeled on the Exodus plagues whose purpose was to harden Pharaoh's heart. So it's to show that both Israel and then later men in the church were spiritually destitute and were beginning to undergo judgment. In fact, if you look at the letters, uh, the letters are presented in a covenantal form. They're, they're, they're presented as a continuation of true Israel. I'm not going to go into this in, in depth here, but um, if you look at the structure of the law in the Old Testament, for example, the Ten Commandments, which is true with Old Testament treaties here, you get a preamble, remember, uh, I am the Lord your God, Exodus uh, 20. And then two, the historical prologue, what is that? I have brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then three, the stipulations, the Ten Commandments. And then, what do you get? You get witnesses. Uh, sometimes it's the heavens and the earth, or it's Moses. Um, you get witnesses, and finally, uh, the treaties are concluded with blessings and cursings. And so, let's look at the letters. First of all, the preamble. This is true of every letter now. The word of him who? In other words, this is Jesus identifying himself. Uh, prologue. I know your works. Stipulations. He tells them to repent. <laughs> of whatever they're, they're doing. Now, he doesn't tell Smyrna and Philadelphia to repent because uh, they're faithful. Then the, the witness. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit's the witness. The blessing to him who overcomes, I will grant. This is a covenantal structure. The only reason I'm presenting this is to show that the church really is now in a covenantal relation with God just as Israel was. They are the continuation of true Israel. So the reason that the prophets, Jesus and John, use symbols is so that Israel and we should perceive spiritual reality and not merely listen to abstractions about it. We may make the following deduction then, and it is this. I'm going to have to flip through here a few things. I had some more to say on the uh, church as a covenant, but I don't have time. So... What we conclude is this. Revelation symbols either sedate us or shock us back into the reality of our relation with God. That's the main idea of the symbols. Revelation symbols either sedate us or shock us back into the reality 
of our relation with God. People, we're to look at the picture and then apply it to our lives. That's actually what parable means. In Hebrew, it's, it's pronounced mashal, and it, it literally means applic- It means comparison. You're to compare the picture to yourself. Apply it to our lives. It can, this can cause us to look at the truth and reality in a different way so that we can be shocked back into the reality of our faith. We too often don't want to hear the truth, and if it's presented straightforwardly to convict us of sin, sometimes we won't accept the fact of our sin. Sometimes we'll rationalize it away. We are professional rationalizers. Now, if you're married, you will know this. When your mate accuses you of something, what's the first thing you do? Ah, well, it really wasn't my fault, or I really didn't mean to do that, or no, you're wrong, or... How often do we immediately say, I am sinful, and you're right? (laughs) That's not our first response. But often it should be, right? Um, So, uh, to give you an example of this, uh, in in 2 Samuel, you'll remember, uh, David had sinned by committing adultery with Bathsheba and killing her husband. Uriah, and the shock effect of the parables on the believing yet sinfully complacent king is a phenomenon observable in 2 Samuel. I want to read it to you. This is amazing because this is a beautiful example of of the shock effect of the parables in Revelation. The Lord sent Nathan to David, this is 2 Samuel 12, and he came to him and said, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. So he's, he's saying a parable here. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. It grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread, drink of his cup, lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and the rich man was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. So David's really, really caught up in this parable and um, uh, and, and is caught up in being uh, emotionally angry with this man. And then Nathan said to David, remember what he says? You are the man. You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, as I anointed you king. And he goes on and talk about that there's going to be judgment for David. So David's become anesthetized, and then he gets judgment. Uh, very interesting. So he gets, he's anesthetized, he gets the parable, and judgment. But it does shock him back into the reality of his faith. I mean, we do things. I mean, sometimes, I mean, if you, maybe you accidentally shoot someone. And um, you shouldn't have. You might have to go to jail for that. Um, You're still a believer, and I'm sure God would use that to shock you into a number of things about your faith. So sometimes we have to suffer consequences as David did, but he was shocked back into the reality of his relation with God. And that is the way these symbols function in the book of Revelation. Many think these are only about the future. But actually, yes, some are. But some are about the present. If you read it all as some kind of future uh, uh, events to take place, then we're kind of separated from it. Well, that's interesting. You know, you know Russia's going to do this, and China's here, and, and, and the, and the uh, common uh, market is here, and uh, Egypt is there. And Israel's been regathered, uh, and so this must be the time that God that, that, uh, revelation is going to take place. Um, well, I think that all of these symbols are about uh, the, their purpose. What is it? Really, it's for judgment and to bring the remnant back into their close relation with God. What, what are areas of our life to which we are spiritually insensitive? Now, obviously, there's extreme poverty and therefore suffering in a lot of parts of our country. And since we don't see pictures of it, we we often don't take any steps to 
contribute to it. Now, I know there are churches that will take trips, not just overseas, but to different parts of our country to, to help these places out. But often, since we don't see these places, we're, we're not motivated to help. As in Hitler's Germany, many people knew about the concentration camps. But because they didn't see what was going on in those camps, they weren't as agitated to take any action as German people. Some sectors of the American church need to make themselves more aware of these poverty-stricken areas where we can take abortion. People hear about it. If they saw pictures, I think they'd be motivated to do something different. What are some areas of our lives to which we're spiritually insensitive? Maybe it's a wrong relationship. Maybe as husbands and wives, we're complacent about nourishing one another with the word of God. Do you have a time when you get together, if you're married, do you have a time when you get together with your mate and you read scripture or something related to scripture? Perhaps parents are so busy in their jobs, they rarely see their family. They're complacent about it. They may think, well, it's, this is not ideal, but this is the way it's got to be. Um, it's not that harmful. Some pastors may become place, complacent about not nourishing their congregation with God's word in the way they should. And when that happens, then fertile ground is formed for false teaching to grow. So what sin are you and I complacent about, about which we need to be shocked? Let me pray about that right now. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would cause us to be aware of whatever sin we may have that we're complacent about, perhaps anesthetized to. Shock us, Lord, into the reality of our faith and cause us to repent. In Christ's name, amen. It's not the end of the message. That's just prayer in the midst of the message. So Revelation symbols, either sedate or shock us back into the reality of our relation with God. Now, will we be spiritually sedated or shocked? Revelation gives us an example. This is amazing. From the letters, how a church was anesthetized and then shows us a symbol in the visionary section that shocks them about what they're anesthetized to. So let's look at that now. We're going to look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, verse 20 to 25. It's the letter to Thyatira. I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so they may commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent. She does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. I'll kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I'll give to each one of you according to your deeds. Remember, that's the middle verse of all of the letters. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Notice how he says, um, I say to the rest who are in Thyatira. That word is a word for the remnant. It's a word for the remnant. So, What's going on here? Well, uh, Jezebel probably was teaching. Notice what her teaching was back here. That she, uh, she's a prophetess, teaches and leads my bondservants astray so they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now that word immorality, everywhere it's used elsewhere in the book of Revelation, it is figurative. It's figurative for illicit spiritual intercourse with an idol. That's what it's about. That's why it's called immorality. You shouldn't be having that intimate spiritual relationship, intercourse with the idol. And um, eating things sacrificed to idols. Probably what was going on, there were temples to the various gods in all of the cities, uh, multiple temples. 
And what would happen is you would have a temple, uh, uh, and, and then it would be a god who was the protector of your particular trade. Maybe you were a silversmith, or maybe you dealt in woolen goods, uh, etc. There would be a god for that. And you were expected to pay your union dues. And what was that? At least once a year you go and eat a meal dedicated to the God protecting your particular trade. Well, that's the least you can do. If you didn't do that, you'd be ostracized and you wouldn't be able to practice your trade. She is trying to come up with a rationalization so that you can go and do that and still be a Christian. No problem. So... Uh, uh, they, they, they can go and eat things sacrificed to idols. They can go into these temples. Who knows? She might have been saying, hey, you know what? There are demons behind the idols. You need to go. And when you go, you'll learn more about how the devil operates. And uh, that'll be instructive for you. Or she may have been rationalizing by saying, you know, uh, when you go, just pray for the uh, blessing of the Roman Empire, that, that God would, would bless it in his common grace blessings. Or when you go, uh, just, you know, don't worship. Just, just eat the food. Who knows what the rationalization was? But the point was, they were identifying with idolatry. They would have been seen by others as identifying with idols. And can you imagine as they leave and, and live their life and they're, they're witnessing to people and, and, and the unbelievers say, what's the deal? You go to these, you, you worship idols. You don't really believe in this Jesus. It would compromise their witness. But the elders of the church, they, they were putting up with it. They were saying, well, okay, you know, let's, uh, it's kind of an uh, ancient postmodernism. She has her view. We don't agree, but, you know, let, let's let her uh, exercise her conscience and, and, and her rights that way. They, they were uh, allowing this to happen. They tolerated her teaching. Um, even though they may have disagreed. And so John wants to shock the slug, sluggish Christians so they will discern the gravity of the situation. So later in Revelation 17, John paints Jezebel as another character, as Babylon the whore. Now we're going to see that, so let's go. Let's go to John 17. What's going to happen now is Jezebel is going to be interpreted by another symbol, which is to shock those elders to realize who they're really dealing with in Jezebel. So let's look at this. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. There it is. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And upon her forehead a name was written, the mystery of Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. Actually, the Greek is, uh, I wondered uh, with wonder. Uh, I really wondered. And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? He should have said, why do you wonder, wonder? Uh, I shall tell you the mystery of the woman of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. So, uh, let, let, let's think about this narrative that we have just read. Um, Babylon the whore, uh, in chapter 17 and verse 16, uh, it is said that <clears throat> the kings will eat her flesh. So she's going to have a demise at the end of the age. And it's described as kings will eat her flesh. And that is an allusion to 2 Kings 9.36, the demise of Jezebel. They will eat the flesh of Jezebel. And Jezebel's destruction likewise happened according, quote, to the word of the Lord, as is true of Babylon the Great. In chapter 17 and verse 17, this happened according to the word of the Lord. 
And if I wanted to, we could take a whole session on how Babylon the Great is painted or patterned after Jezebel. For example, before her death, the Old Testament Jezebel, quote, colored her eyes and adorned her head, end quote, like a harlot. Both function as, quote, kings. Both seduce people. Both deceive people by sorceries. Both persecute and kill the saints. Remember Jezebel? And I could go on. There are actually about 12 different ways that Babylon is patterned after Jezebel. So Babylon and Jezebel are the same. That's the point. Okay? Jezebel is being interp interpreted as Babylon the whore. Who is Babylon the whore then? That's interesting. We'll have to have, discuss that over coffee. <laughs> I partly agree with you, by the way. Partly. I think it's the entire corrupt economic, religious, and social system, as well as the apostate church and Israel. So let me repeat that. Basically, it's the entire corrupt economic, religious, and social system in the apostate church is kind of joined in with that as, as has apostate Israel. So that's Babylon, the entire corrupt economic, religious, and social system. It's not literal Babylon. It's not literal uh, Iraq and the Middle East. Some believe that Babylon's going to be revived again because Israel's being revived again, and they take this very literally. It's very hard to take this literally. I mean, Babylon's riding on the back of a beast, and so on. She's sitting on many waters. What does she have, a giant uh, uh, tube or something uh, that she's uh, riding on? Um, so Babylon the Great, then, is uh, the world. And that's who Jezebel is. Now, past commentators have tended to identify Babylon only with the ungodly Roman culture or only with apostate the church or only apostate Israel. Um, most have preferred identification with the Roman society. Well, yes, at the time uh, that John was writing, yes, but it, whatever society is that way in coming generations is that way. So it is the religious, economic, social culture of the evil system, including the apostate church and unbelieving Israel. So in this light, the link between Babylon and Jezebel in Revelation 2 suggests that Jezebel more precisely is the apostate sector of the church through which the religious social economic system of Babylon the Great works. In other words, she's Babylon the Great coming into the church and trying to get the church to conform to Babylon the Great. One person has defined worldliness as this. Worldliness is what any particular culture does to make sin seem normal and righteousness seem strange. And this is part of what Jezebel was doing. For example, there are pastors who will use the right language uh, biblically, but they don't believe it and they'll teach something different, even though they're using the right language. That's part of Babylon the Great, uh, the apostate church. Um, so John wants to shock the sluggish Christians in Thyatira so that they'll discern the severity of the situation. So, John presents Jezebel and her true colors in Revelation 17. And this explicitly, verses 6 through 7, explicitly underscore the shock effect that this had even on John. Notice the end of verse 6. And when I saw her, I wondered, I wondered. Let me just get my Greek text here and, and translate that. On 
I wondered while beholding her with great wonder. So it's not just wonder, wonder. It's wonder, wonder greatly. That's the idea. He, 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 he was shocked. And he was astonished. And the angel asked the question, why, why are you shocked? Why are you astonished? In the next verse. Why do you wonder? And that idea of John's astonishment, his wondering, actually, I'm not going to go into it, but it comes from the language of Daniel 4, where Daniel is uh, interpreting a symbolic vision about Nebuchadnezzar. He's pictured as a tree that's cut down. And, and when, when, John's, when Daniel sees the vision, he's appalled, he's shocked, he's fearful. And that's the idea here, using the same language. John is shocked. He's appalled. He's fearful. He expresses fear about this nightmarish vision that he's just seen concerning the horrible nature of the beast and the woman and their persecution. His spirit was troubled. Now, why was he so shocked? Well, I think one reason was that in chapter 17 and verse 4, I want you to see this. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand, etc. Didn't have good things in her hand. Um, but that same language is used of the bride of Christ in chapter 21. Verse 19 and verses 18 to 21. In fact, chapter 18 and verse 16 goes further and says that Babylon the Great, the, the harlot, was clothed. In addition, she had linen. And in chapter 19 and verse 8, the linen is said to be the righteous deeds of the saints, which it is there. So what's going on? She's presented as a very godly figure. She's presented like the bride of Christ. So as John is seeing this in the vision, you've got to realize he's actually seeing this vision. As he's seeing this, oh, she's, she's pretty good. Um, so is, she, is she related to the bride of Christ? And then, furthermore, the high priest clothing in the Old Testament is explained in the same way. In Exodus 28, 5 through 12, she, she looks like a high priest. Like the bride of Christ, like the high priest. On the other hand, the beast that she's riding is full of blasphemous names. The cup in the woman's hand is full of abominations, as you can see, and the unclean things of her immorality. She's called the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth in chapter 17 and verse 5. Notice, mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. And the woman he saw was drunk from the blood of the saints and from the blood of the witnesses. Notice, drunk with the blood of the saints. So, this was true dissonance. She looks like she's a bride of Christ. She looks like a high priest. But what? What's, and and he, he just appalled over this. He can't figure it out. He's appalled. He's shocked. So John, like the readers in Thyatira, with regard to Jezebel, he's temporarily captivated, isn't he? The elders are temporarily captivated. But it becomes very clear who she is. She is the ungodly harlot of the earth, the ungodly religious, social, and economic aspect of the world. The elders were blinded to this because she was a spiritually attractive figure, Jezebel was, as Babylon was to John. Part of the depiction of the Babylonian woman, as I've said, is taken from the portrayal of Jezebel. Since Jezebel was a leader and stood for the model uh, of false teachers, in chapter 2, she is none other than a pseudo-Christian leader. She's none other than Babylon herself in the midst of the church who eventually will be judged along with the persecutors from outside the church. And so they had the same problem with Jezebel as John did with uh, Babylon, temporarily captivated. And they were letting her do that. But in reality, she was going down the central aisle of the church, writing spiritually the devil himself, or the, the devil's beast. Figuratively speaking, spiritually speaking, 
There wasn't an aisle, I'm sure, in the church at that time. Um, so the point in Revelation 2.20 is this. As long as you elders allow Jezebel to teach such things within the confines of the church, the church itself is beginning to have spiritual intercourse with the devil's whore. And with the devilish beast himself, upon whose back she rides, she is the opposite of the pure woman in chapter 12, who symbolizes the pure, true people of God. She's saying to the Christians in Thyatira, Oh, you want to tolerate this teaching, which you don't think is too bad? Well, if you do, you're dealing with the devil himself. You'll be destroyed. What they thought was insignificant compromise and sin was really a crack in their spiritual dikes, which could have let through a flood of spiritual evil overwhelming them if they continued to allow her to have full freedom of teaching. They needed to be shocked like John to the true, deceptive, and evil reality of the false teacher in their midst who in some ways could have seemed to be godly. It reminds me, by the way, and I've experienced this myself personally, I have been in classes, not Dallas Seminary, I've been in classes where professors, they were the very smart, they were the most humorous, they, they, they were excellent teachers, and they were unbelievers. I remember uh, sitting in one class and the professor was saying, well, the flood's a myth, uh, creation account's a myth, but they were all just so amazingly sharp. I mean, they were, they just really played the part from the world's perspective, but they were false. Jezebel was something like that. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. John's saying to us that Revelation symbols either sedate or shock us back into the reality of our relation with God. Is there a sinful area in our lives that we do not think is really that bad? Will we be sedated or shocked into the reality of our faith? Sometimes on the way to church, I see people jogging or doing some other sporting activity. Probably some of those uh, uh, I see. Maybe they've already been to church or they're going to church later, but some probably don't go to church at all. And uh, no problem. They think everything's fine, but they need to hear God's word and be shocked. But they see no need to be with God's people. Everything's not all right with them. They need to be shocked by God's word. So the reason, come back. The reason that John uses symbols is so that we should actually see and perceive spiritual reality and not merely listen to abstractions about it and accordingly be shocked concerning those sins about which we have become anesthetized. You've heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. And that's one reason why God communicates in symbols. You heard about the uh, bombings in Nagasaki and uh, uh, Hiroshima. But I'm sure probably most here heard about it and then looked at the pictures. You have a much different sense about it when you look at the It makes a big impact. It's the same in our spiritual lives. We get so accustomed and comfortable with sinful situations we need radical pictures to be presented to us so we can perceive the true gravity of our spiritual situation. And that's what the book of Revelation is about. That's what it does. It's not just pictures about helicopters and future warfare. A lot of those pictures are about the church now. In fact, I would say it this way. Revelation is not so much a futurology, but a redemptive historical psychology a framework of thinking that we should live in now. It tells us how to think now. Yes, there's some future in it, there's no doubt. But there's a lot of now in it, too. I remember some years ago, I made an appointment with an oral hygienist to check and clean my teeth. And at one point, uh, she had to leave to go check, I think, the, my x-rays. And, and, and while she was gone, there was a picture, right? You couldn't miss it. You, uh, you're, 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 they seat you so you look at it. It's the Phases of gum disease, from really nice gums and the end, bad gums. And I hadn't been in a long time to a dental hygienist. And when she came back in, I said, where am I on the chart? She said, oh, you're, you're heading toward pretty bad gum disease. I said, well, my gums don't hurt. She said, that's the genius of gum disease, that it doesn't hurt until it's almost too late. And sometimes that's the way it is with sin. We need the parabolic pictures, like those pictures of gum disease to shock us. Uh, after I saw those pictures and her interpretation of the pictures as it related to me, I 
flossed every day. I brushed my teeth in the morning and the evening. And um, now I even have a water pick. So anyway, uh, I, I, I took action. Um, revelation symbols either sedate or shock us back into the reality of our relation with God. The phrase about Israel and unbelief not hearing from Isaiah 6 and Matthew 13 is turned by John positively. If you notice at the end of the letters, he who has an ear let him hear, as Ezekiel had done, as Jesus had done. But the transformation makes an address really more to the faithful who have begun to fall under the spiritual anesthesia, but nevertheless still have ears to hear. Those within the covenant community of the Asia Minor churches never responding to Jesus' exhortation that they have no ears to hear God's exhortation because they do not know the Lord. Such people will suffer the same judgments that John's revelation depicts happening to the unbelieving world. That's interesting. I always thought the book of Revelation and the judgments, oh, that's, that's the world of unbelievers. They're going to be judged. And when I finished writing my commentary, chapter 22, it hit me. It starts out addressing the church. It's about the church in chapters 2 to 3. And it ends with the church and warnings to the church. Don't follow false teachers. Don't, don't uh, perform idolatry. And I realize these judgments are judgments that will fall on pseudo-believers who go to church. And it will fall on them just as it will on unbelievers who have never been to church. So we need to trust in Christ's redemptive work. What is that? He came to do what Adam should have done, and he did it. He perfectly formed, performed obedience. And he died on the cross, took our sins, and he came to life again. And that coming to life vindicated that he had done what Adam should have done, and his obedience is passed on to us, as well as him taking the penalty for us. So the Holy Spirit comes into us, giving us a new heart and eyes to see, ears to hear. Gives us sensitivity to God's word, motivates us to respond to it. Perhaps we're Christians, but we're not motivated to change certain areas of our lives. I encourage all of us in that condition, come to God's word. Come to the book of Revelation and be shocked by it. I think there are some in the church who are doing pretty well. Well, we found that in the letters, didn't we? Smyrna and Philadelphia, there were two. So there's a remnant. How do the pictures relate to them? Well, they're still sinful. They can still be shocked. They get a little shock treatment every day. But and in those, the, many of the visions encourage them, like the final vision of the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and earth. That encourages them. So the symbols either afflict the comfortable or comfort the afflicted. Revelation's promises, it promises great blessings to those who hear and obey its message. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things which are written in it, for the time is near. May God give us grace. So if we have ears, we'll hear what his symbols are saying. Symbols either sedate or shock us into the reality of our faith. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would cause us to come to your word, your word everywhere is a word that can sedate us or shock us into the reality of our faith. And we pray that uh, as we come to the book of Revelation, we would see those symbols operating that way, and it would affect our lives. And we would align ourselves with you. Think your thoughts after you. Do those things pleasing to you. Say those things that are conformed to your image, we pray in Christ.